Good morning. My name is Chris Ndikumana. I'm the host of the Kanguka broadcast. You are about to listen to today's broadcast translated from Kirundi to English. Be blessed. Today's Friday. I'd like to share with you a word that shows that it doesn't require a lot of sacrifices in order to go to heaven. Some think that to go to heaven, you have to be a preacher, you have to have done a lot of things, you have to bring many people to Christ. It's true that when you do good works, there will be a reward in heaven, but that's not the condition to go to heaven. Accessing heaven is the easiest thing. You must accept Jesus as your Lord, you humble yourself, and you acknowledge that you are a sinner. When you humble yourself and you acknowledge that you are a sinner, you recognize the work that Jesus did on the cross and you ask for repentance. The blood of Jesus cleanses you, and from that moment, you are a new creation. It's true that it's important to be baptized because it's Jesus' commandment. Once you have accepted Jesus, it's good to be baptized. But it's not baptism that gives you access to heaven. It's not the sacrifices that give you access to heaven. It's not the works you have done that give you access to heaven. You have access to heaven from the moment you accept that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You acknowledge that you are a sinner, you confess with your mouth, and you invite Jesus into your life. There are those who listen to me every Friday and who refuse to make the decision to accept Jesus because they are attached to their religion. Religion does not save. There is no religion on this earth that will give you access to heaven, but it's your confession, it's the acknowledgement of what Jesus did to forgive you. It's the only way that will give you access to heaven. The church can help you in spiritual growth, in teaching. There are many things you can learn from the church, but the church will not save you. It's Jesus who saves. It's Jesus who will cleanse you of your sins, he will wash you of your sins from the moment you accept him and invite him into your life. When the people of Israel were preparing to go to the promised land, they had to put blood on the doors of their homes as a symbol. And when the angel of God came, he saw the blood and passed over. It's the blood they put on the door that protected them, and this blood is the image of Jesus' blood today. Let me show you an example in the Bible. If you read in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43, It tells us about Jesus when he was on the cross, and there were also two thieves who were crucified beside him. The two thieves had stolen. They were crucified because they were criminals. But Jesus was on the cross even though he was pure. He had never sinned. The Bible testifies that Jesus never committed sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, clearly shows that Jesus never sinned. So Luke chapter 23 verse 39 says that one of the crucified criminals was mocking him. He mocked Jesus, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He was mocking Jesus, implying, if you are the one who performed miracles, the Son of God, the King, how can you be crucified like us? You can free yourself, you can save yourself and us. In fact, he wasn't asking him to save him, he was mocking him. He was insulting him. In verse 40, we can see that the other thief had a very different attitude. The other thief rebuked the one who was insulting Jesus. Jesus was in the middle but the other thief didn't address Jesus, he addressed the other criminal like him. He said, don't you fear God? since you are under the same condemnation. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? In verse 41, he said, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. In other words, he was defending Jesus. He was saying, Jesus has not sinned. He has not stolen. He has not killed. But he is being punished like us, even though he has not sinned and we have sinned. In verse 42, he said something very interesting. He turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It was a simple prayer. Verse 42 shows that this thief acknowledged that he is a sinner. He recognized that Jesus could save him. That's why he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In verse 43, Jesus answered him, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not later, but today you will be with me in paradise. It meant that the two would die. In fact, all three would die on the same day. The two criminals and Jesus would die on the same day. And on that same day, the thief who humbled himself and acknowledged that he is a sinner was saved. He gained access to paradise just by confessing and nothing else. All of you who are listening to me this morning, if you acknowledge that you are a sinner and you open your mouth and humble yourself before Jesus, I can assure you that this very day, your name will be written in the book of life. Yes, you will see other things later. You will grow, you will serve God. Yes, you will be baptized. But right now, if you make the commitment, your name will be written in the book of life and the rest will follow. You must accept Jesus if you want to go to heaven. You must confess and acknowledge that you are a sinner. You must recognize that you can do nothing without him. You need to acknowledge what he has done for you, that he died and rose again. You need to forsake this sinful life. All of you who live in adultery, in fornication, in lies, in hatred, or other things, you need to come before Jesus and confess your sins. Call on him so he can come into your life. The pleasure you have now in the flesh is for a short moment. But Jesus will give you eternal life. If you truly want to make this decision, kneel down and call on him. 
If you need the assistance of a servant of God, you can give us a call at plus two five six seven eight one three seven seven three three seven. Now in the teaching portion of the broadcast and we're going to continue the teaching called, Who is the Holy Spirit? We've been doing this teaching for a while now. We started it back on March 18th. If you're new to the Kanguka broadcast and haven't been able to catch up on all this teaching, you can go to the archive section and follow everything we've discussed from the beginning. We've already talked about many things concerning the Holy Spirit because we really want to understand the true identity of the Holy Spirit. Yesterday, I was talking about what happened on the day of Pentecost. I explained that the word Pentecost existed long before Acts chapter 2. Pentecost was an annual feast. The Feast of Pentecost already existed in Israel, but Jesus chose to send the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which was 50 days after Jesus' resurrection and 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven. We saw how there were 120 people in the upper room. They persevered in prayer in order to receive the promise. I mentioned that this doesn't just apply to the Holy Spirit. Whatever promise you have from God, you need to persevere in prayer, and God will fulfill what He has promised through prayer. There are promises that never come to pass. There are those who die without the fulfillment of God's promise because they don't want to approach God, they don't want to spend time in prayer. There are promises that can only be realized through prayer. So something extraordinary happened while they were in prayer. There was a power that manifested, the power of the Holy Spirit. We saw this in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And verse 3 says that each of them had tongues of fire resting on their heads. I don't know if there's another time when these things happened, but on that day, they all had tongues of fire resting on their heads. Many people interpret these tongues as symbols of the power to preach without fear, without hesitation. You know that Peter was afraid before being filled with the Holy Spirit. But when the tongue of fire rested on his head, everything changed. If you read in verse 14, you see a different Peter. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times, but now he's no longer ashamed. He can stand firm before a crowd, before thousands of people listening to him. The foreigners, the Galileans, the Jews, anyone, he wasn't afraid. He stood up and spoke boldly. In verse 14, he said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. So when the Holy Spirit descended, it was nine in the morning. At that time, people could drink alcohol in the evening, but this was in the morning. It was absurd to think they were drunk. Peter wanted to reason with them to show that they weren't drunk. In verse 16, he said, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He begins to bring them back to God's promises because Joel had prophesied about the Holy Spirit. He said this in the Old Testament. What did Joel say? What did the prophet say? He said, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. That's Joel's prophecy. At that time, there were a few prophets chosen by God. They were the ones who had the right to have the Holy Spirit so they could prophesy. But now, the Holy Spirit doesn't belong only to the prophets. Every Christian who believes in Jesus Christ is entitled to the Holy Spirit. That's why he says in verse 18 that God said that in those days, he would pour out his Spirit, and they would prophesy. And verse 19 says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. I encourage you to read the entire chapter. But now, due to time constraints, I'll jump to verse 37, which shows us that everyone was amazed. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were deeply moved by the words that came out of Peter's mouth, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The fact that they asked what to do shows that they were touched. In verse 38, Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's repentance. There are doctrines today that say we shouldn't ask people to repent. But this passage is in the New Testament. It's not the Old Testament. He said, repent. That's the message we need to give today to everyone. Repent. There's no heaven without repentance. There's another very important thing I'd like to say. In chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you continue reading to chapter 4, Acts chapter 4 from verse 21 to verse 30. We see that after some time, they preached, they were in the city. But one day, they were persecuted, they were afraid, and they prayed together. Verse 31 says that when they prayed, the place where they were assembled shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, 
I want you to understand that these are the same people who were filled with the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, who were once again filled with the Holy Spirit in chapter 4. So, we're not filled with the Holy Spirit only once. God willing, I will continue on Monday and I will also talk to you about speaking in tongues. I wish you all a wonderful weekend. If you're blessed or transformed by Kanguka teachings, you can send us a WhatsApp audio on plus 2567813773337.